My name is Weza Matomane. If you forget all of that, just call me Weza, that guy, just like that. <laughs> all right, so this is going to be super informal um, in, a, in a sense because we want to encourage a fantastic dialogue here. This is an exchange of ideas because the theme that we're going to be talking about right now is actually pretty exciting. And uh, not one man can really um, have a correct answer here. That's why we really need everyone to... to uh, and women. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> we really need everyone's input in, in uh, creating this uh, fantastic future that we want to create. Now, looking at CSIR, we've already now, uh, we, and we're currently actually celebrating 70 years of ideas that work. How are you guys feeling about that, by the way? Woo! Yeah. <laughs> fantastic. And now, the exciting thing is that we are now looking at the next 70 years. How will that look like? That's the question, right? How will we do business? How will we be communicating with each other? How will CSIR look like 70 years from now? Will there be buildings such as now? Or now, now this is now question marks that, that could appear in your mind. Maybe you might even have some answers. And that's the answers that we're actually going to try and um, sass out of you this, eve this afternoon. But I'm joined by a fantastic panelist right here of uh, seasoned and unseasoned professionals. <laughs> Just to make sure it's nice and balanced. So, uh, I'll, I'll, yes, yes, exactly. So I'll let them uh, introduce themselves. I'll also just try and uh, give you a little bit of a, a preview of what uh, we know about them. So first up, she is the ex-president of the South African Institute of Physics and uh, currently a part of the, um, she's currently a, a principal research scientist at CSIR. Please welcome Dr. Um, it is Egel, all right? I, I'm saying it right. It's Egel Gledel. Yeah. Smile and wave, smile and wave. <laughs> so that's the lovely lady right there. If you may, just uh, maybe about one or two sentences about some of the things that you're doing currently at CSR. Okay. Um, so there's a microphone. The, um, focus is um, currently aeronautics. I'm looking at accelerating flight but I refuse to be divided by divisions. So I've worked in built environment with NLC, in biosciences, with the MSM people, um, and who else have I left out? There are several. Um, transport. MDS. In MDS. Um, and I think that's the unique value proposition of the CSR going forward too. Fantastic. Let's give a round of applause. Great stuff indeed. And uh, going o over to my next uh, panelist, uh, this uh, gentleman right here, is, um, he holds a PhD in engineering and he's uh, leading in the science center. I mean, this is the, actually the energy center, uh, by the way. Um, uh, please welcome Dr. Tobias Bischoff. A word or two, doctor. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm leading the establishment of an integrated energy research center at the CSR. Um, main focus there is around, um, on the technology side, renewable technologies and system integrating integration of these renewables. So that's, uh, in, a, in a very short summary, that's uh, anything that, that fits into that uh, theme. Either how do we generate renewable energy or convert renewable energy and how do we integrate that into the energy system. Everything that's related to that we cover in the center, in the short sense. Fantastic. Now, my next gentleman is actually one that, uh, he's got that wow factor about him. Now, listen to this. Uh, he completed his master's uh, um, on the design of nuclear reactors in only eight months. Mm. Yeah, ne? just one word. Mm. <laughs> uh, his master's thesis was the best master's in physics in the country in that year. Mm. Another one. Mm. <laughs> Please welcome uh, Dr. Nicolene Gavinder. Thank, thank you for the introduction. Uh, basically, I do... Uh, Is it on? Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Uh, I work on graphical processor units, high-performance computing, and particle transport, as well as looking at the origins of the universe. Okay. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Now the pressure's on. I mean, the w previous person had a wow factor. What will happen with the next gentleman? Well, let's find out. He is the youngest PhD holder in CSIR. Okay? Hmm. 
that, that's the first one. Listen to this. He matriculated at the age of 14. <laughs> what were you doing when you were 14? <laughs> Hi. So uh, he, he completed his doctorate in uh, biochemistry at the age of 23. Please welcome um, Dr. Previn Naika. <laughs> Thank you, Reza. Uh, so um, currently I'm a postdoc uh, at Biosciences um, and uh, we uh, work on a few projects. Uh, primarily right now, uh, one of them deals with uh, optimization of the resin magnetic uh, microspheres for use in uh, the uh, for use in proteomics research, and uh, other projects I work on um, involve improving um, livestock diagnostics and vaccine matching. In a nutshell, yeah. In a nutshell, fantastic. Let's give a round of applause. I heard one of the ladies ask, and I'm not going to mention names. Does he have a girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to mention who, but it was somewhere here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, starting off yesterday, of course, we had this sort of fantastic, um, f the, the opening of the fifth CSIR conference on ideas at work, and we had uh, the Deputy President of the Republic of South Africa, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa, of, uh, officially open the proceedings. Now, um, in his address, uh, Ramaphosa, uh, Ramaphosa also said that the, the science is the center of human progress, and uh, the work that CSIR is doing is actually transforming our society. It's transforming our society in many ways. It's affecting the ways we do business, the, day, the, day, uh, the way we live our daily lives, and also the way we solve problems uh, on the everyday life as well. Now, just looking into this now, could, let's just find out from our panelists and also, of course, from yourselves as well. This is a bit of a, you know, a, bit of a chat between us all. 70 years from now, what will CSIR look like? That's quite a question. 70 years from now. Let's start off with the energy sector, because I think well, for, we will just start in a, in a clockwise fashion. For, for me, it's very easy. This entire campus will be powered by our own sun, wind, and biomass resources. Okay. So it will be 100% uh, energy autonomous, based on renewables. And, that's uh, <laughs> and how do you... Uh, uh, are they, are, they already, um, are, are they already uh, projects in line with that? Um, and, um, and if so, what, what, are some of the, what are some of these projects? Yes, we, we, we have started with, an, with, an, uh, with a program, actually, um, to, uh, to make the campus energy autonomous. Um, we have um, uh, the, 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 the primary energy mix will come from the sun, from wind, and from biomass. So at the end of the day, all of that is sun energy because the wind is based on the sun and the biomass is also based on the sun. So we are entering the age of, um, um, of solar energy as, uh, uh, in, the, in, the best, in the best in that sense. And um, we, um, we have started implementation of um, our solar fleet for the campus already. We have one project up and running. Um, you might have seen it already. It's um, between the building number, behind building 10 from, from here, between building number 10 and the N4 highway. It's a one hectare footprint solar field that already, as we speak right now, produces, well, now we have, it's noon, so it should be at maximum output. It's probably producing something like 10% of our total uh, electricity demand as we speak. Wow. Um, but that's only a starting point. That's probably the, 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 least, um, the least innovative one in the sense of um, looking into the future and how the future will look like. The, um, from, from a 70-year perspective, the most the most innovative um, part of the campus will be the conversion of electricity that we collect and that we harvest from the sun and from wind to convert that into synthetic fuels, liquid fuels, natural gas. So all the, all the fuels that you would today con uh, see as your primary energy sources, we will actually shift that whole paradigm where electricity, because it's so cheap to produce renewables-based electricity, will become the new primary energy source. And then you take electricity as an input to all the rest of what you need in the energy sector. So it's a complete shift of mindset where it all starts with electricity based on sun and wind. And then you go into the conversion of whatever you need, be it heat, be it fuels for aviation industry, for, for ground-based transportation. Um, and, uh, and that is something that we are piloting on the campus as well. Um, 
uh, but that is a technology that is that is further away from uh, from commercialization but we want to drive that uh, that commercialization process so hopefully in 70 years from now um, South Africa will be, be because it's endowed with very la uh, high sun and wind resources will be one of the leading one of the handful of countries that will fuel the global economy with synthetic fuels based on renewable electricity and uh, hopefully in 70 years we will look back and say yes at the CSR we created the knowledge base around that and we, we helped to create the, the, the technology spin-off companies, um, the new Sasols basically. Yeah, talking about Sasol itself, uh, we, we, um, we do know that Sasol right now is um, one of the leaders in terms of um, gas to liquid technology and also um, coal to, to liquid technology as well. Now, right now they, they also contribute quite a lot to the country's GDP. Now, don't you feel that they, there's resistance coming from companies this size making so much money out of things that might not be green as, uh, in, in terms of now, um, um, they, they might be con con uh, contributing quite a lot in terms of carbon emissions into the atmosphere, but they, they have so much money within them that they would resist such a, such a move into, into the solar world. Well, I mean, you are quite right. There's, there are huge industries globally that are, that are earning their money in the energy space. And for them, this radical uh, uh, transition towards a different energy system globally is a, is a challenge to them. But I would actually, I would almost exclude Sasol from that because Sasol actually is in a very good position to, um, to embrace power to liquids exactly because of the reason they know how to do how to convert coal into liquid, they know how to convert gas into liquid. So a large part of the process that is needed to, if you think about it as a, as a black box, you have power coming in and liquids are coming out, where today coal is going in and liquids is coming out. Large part of that process is actually exactly what Sasol has, uh, has, has uh, optimized over the last couple of uh, uh, decades. And uh, they are in a perfect position to be one of the leaders uh, in that space. So I don't think for Sasol it's a real threat. They are just replacing one input, which is coal, which they have to, they are not sitting on the coal mines. So the, the coal input they have to pay for. Yeah. Uh, and they are not just replacing one input with another input. Um, I think other, other industries are much more uh, challenged with the, like uh, crude oil um, uh, producers who are actually sitting on the wells of the crude oil because they, they are the ones that, that then um, might, have, might be left with stranded assets. So. Um, actually, uh, I, I want to actually almost carry on with this energy debate because if, if we look at, um, I actually visited CSIR not too long ago and then I saw a couple of the BMW green cars. I, I don't know what they're called, but they, they look lovely. Is these um, hybrids, right? Yeah, they're absolutely fantastic electric. stuff. They're electric cars, right? They are fully electric. Yeah. Fantastic. That's where CSIR is, man, or levels to this game. So, <laughs> so, so now talking exactly about these, these fully electric cars and the, I mean, the industry right now um, where you got VW and um, all the other co competitors that are already in the fuel space, they, they, they would be feeling like they're losing money and the, the Sossels, Again, with, with their petrol, now if petrol's no longer needed, if diesel's no longer needed and it's now fully electric, aren't they also now resisting this movement? Well, uh, I, think, I think, again, re realistically, we are moving into a future where transport will, to a large share, be electrified, but not 100%. Mm -hmm. um, because we, we will, in the, long run, in the long future, we will have ground-based transportation, individual transportation, that is over long-haul distances, a few hundred kilometers, thousand kilometers. Th that is something that we might be able to electrify, but that is very far away. But um, uh, aviation is literally impossible to electrify, and um, uh, ships and uh, like um, intercontinental transportation on the oceans is also difficult to, um, to address other than through liquid fuels. So I don't think liquid fuels will go away um, anytime soon. Probably in 100 years we will still have liquid fuels. The question is how do we produce these liquid fuels? So, um, so I, I would think, I mean, uh, 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 Volkswagen is probably uh, not in the best position to say that the combustion engine is the, is the, ideal, um, is the ideal mean of, of, of locomotion. But, um, I, mean, I mean, yes, especially the large automakers, they are, is, uh, some of them are still very much in the, in, the, in the world, in the thinking of we have to optimize, especially the diesel engine is a very good example, to bring the efficiencies up and up and up, but there's a, there's a limit, and I think we've reached that limit already on the diesel engine, so there's, uh, you can't go further. Um, BMW, on the other hand, was very progressive in the sense that they, if you look at the i3 that we have here, the fully electric vehicle, um, it's not only 
a conventional car being electrified, which is to some extent the Nissan Leaf, which we also have in our fleet. But it's a fundamentally from, from scratch on a blank sheet of paper, a new design for building a car and how to how to build the different assembly groups of the car and what materials to use. So they really rethought the entire way of how you design a car. And you will see that when you, when you have a look at the vehicles that the, that the components, the, um, the body, is not made out of metals but of composite lightweight materials. So it's a completely new, new way of designing vehicles. Um, but yes, there is some, there is some Resistant, let me say, because you've invested into the internal combustion engine, but I think the good news is the internal combustion engine will not go away for some time. Um, and, um, and, and, but, but yes, a little bit more effort on the electric side is probably advisable. Um, maybe to add to the electric side, um, uh, the automotive companies will also have to realize, or they have started realizing already, that they will probably move away from um, companies that produce goods in form of a vehicle that you buy and once you bought it, that's it, where they are, they are more moving into a space where they provide transportation. Um, where, um, uh, uh, like Mercedes has started to, to pilot that in the city of, of Stuttgart, where they, where they provide a platform where they have a number of electric vehicles and, you, and, you, and they are pooled and you, what you basically buy from Mercedes is now the service of being transported from A to B with a very high reliability and with a high, very high convenience. And you don't buy the vehicle, you don't buy the asset. That's also a new business model that they can think of. Interesting stuff. I just uh, want to know if you, if you have any idea of how lucrative that, that model is compared to, you know, now selling, uh, as opposed to selling cars, you know, over, over, well, not immediately, but over 10, 20 year period? Well, well I, think, I think the, quest, the question is whether, um, whether individuals will accept that business model if it's, if it's viable, to, if, it's, if it's convenient to them. Um, if, if it's a business model that is accepted by the end customer, then per definition it will be lucrative. Mm. Because someone will have to supply the service and that someone will make a margin and will make a profit. Mm. Um, I think the, the, the problem is, is not the end state, the problem is the transition because you are, you are a company based on optimizing your production processes and selling vehicles, assets to end customers and now you have to shift that entire company with, I don't know, 100,000 employees into a new direction and that's the, that's the problem, not so much the end state but the transition from A to B. Just to survey, Weza, um, how many of us here have ever driven an electric vehicle? Golf cart. How many of us have driven an electric yeah. vehicle? Yeah. Tesla. <laughs> oh, wow. Hey. We got I, think, I think the mic was saying it has driven one too. Yeah. <laughs> right. I see. I think we had one, one member. One person said they, that's you, man. They're okay. One person. Okay. There's a form? Yeah, seriously, there's a form uh, somewhere on the internet web. I know for Miraka, they emailed us the forms. Fill it in, put your project number. <laughs> put a reason. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So we all g will have a chance to test drive that. So you won't have any excuse next time. All right, fantastic. Now, just talking about um, some, of the, some of the things going forward. I know CSIR is, is, has done quite a lot, uh, and some of, the, some of the work that CSIR has done has sometimes even gone uncelebrated. I mean, we have examples of cement, we have some uh, examples of, uh, of the battery. Uh, Dr. Gavinder, could you just mention some of these uh, in detail, and then also mention what do you think CSIR will be known for, and maybe something that they will actually end up capitalizing on uh, in the years to come? Uh, well, yeah, to continue on the cement story, uh Portland Cement, I don't know how many people know, but that was developed by the CSIR. Oh, nice. And we published it, well, not we, it was a long, long, long time ago. <laughs> but they published it for the entire world. And everyone uses Portland Cement. We get no loyalties, nothing from it. No one knows. So if you see someone, tell them we made Portland Cement. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, you know the digital laser, but they quite, in the field of radar, we were quite world leading. Mm, I don't know now if anyone's from radar, but uh, we're still leading. Okay, that's a good thing. <laughs> but uh, the thing is, all of these innovations, I think we should use as motivation in going forward to see what, what's come before us. There's a nice PowerPoint on the, I don't know, did everyone see the thing when you try to access the interweb? They kind of force it on you because you can't do anything else or click until you press that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it shows you very nicely uh, what the CSR has achieved. 
Fantastic. Uh, any questions regarding some of the, the battery stuff and the cement stuff? Anybody with a question just before we move on? All right. It seems like everybody knew. Nothing new. It's okay. <laughs> we try. <laughs> so now just going forward, we, we come from a time, well, if we, if we know about the, the history of South Africa, we come from a time where the polit political scene was not very, um, it, it was not very conducive for many people um, within um, uh, trying to study and go further with science and technology. It was not really for everyone at the time. 70 years down the line, we, we have a different environment right now. And uh, maybe this one right here should go to one of the born frees, all right? Um, <laughs> Dr. Naika. So, oh, he's the only born free here. So, <laughs> so, so Dr. Naika, just uh, talk, to, talk to us about how, how your environment feels like right now. Um, I mean, it's, it's been quite a, quite, a, quite a number of years. It's been more than 20 years since um, South Africa was declared, you know, a democratic country. Uh, how, is the, how is the scene at, at work? How, how is the scene um, at university? Because I, I, can, I can definitely say that it might have been different from uh, Dr. Gavinder's experience, in, totally. <laughs> yeah, um, I think we are, going, we are still going through a transition period, um, and it's, it's changing almost, almost every year. Um, when, I, when, when I go back to university to tutor, and, I mean, you see... Uh, the students coming in, uh, it's, it's, it's ever changing. So, I mean, the, the experience that I had personally, um, there was one of fair opportunity uh, f for me, that, that's, uh, that's, that's what I can say. Um, and uh, uh, going forward, it's, it's, it's <laughs> I can't think of much else but say that it's interesting. <laughs> Just the, the environment at uh, our universities uh, right now, it's completely different to, to, to how it was in, in the past. Uh, it's quite vibrant, it's, it's nice, it's enjoyable, but it, it's ever-changing. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Egel, having served all over, um, pretty much almost all over CSIR, and probably also going over... Bo um, um, uh, no, no. <laughs> I was not, not going to say overboard, but uh, you know, overboarders. Aha! Come back! <laughs> so having, having you know, um, traveled the world, you, you've seen quite a lot, and, uh, and you've also seen the transition. How, how far has CSIR come? How, how's, the, how's the team looking as, as a whole? And how's, how is it in the labs? Okay. Um, right. When I arrived, nearly 30 years ago, um, I, um, looking good, huh? Uh, <laughs> I, and I thought I understood about 50% of what was going on in meetings. They were all in Afrikaans. Mm -hmm. And it was in a classified environment. The Ang Ang Angolan War was on. I think now that I speak Afrikaans better, that I probably understood about 10 to 20 percent. <laughs> and um, I, looking forward, I mean, it's a completely different place. I haven't really been here for 28 years. There's been an organization um, that uh, has changed constantly. Looking forward 70 years, I um, suspect we'll be more brown, less black and white, um, more love between the races we have now. Um, in the sense of, um, that's, that's why there are more brown people and less black and white, right? Um, <laughs> uh, I think we'll be high rise. We're about 7 trillion people now on the globe. We'll be 10 trillion then. If we're still on the site, we'll be high rise. I see structural glass. I'm astonished this, in this room I don't see cables. I'm sure there won't be cables. There'll be batteries charged by your systems. Um, and um, the projection is that gender equality will have been achieved by 2085, globally, um, given uh, it's Wendelia's talk this morning, right? I think there will still be pockets where men don't carry water, um, if, if there's water that needs to be carried. I think there will still be men who don't take part in raising children. But um, that's the kind of thing I'm seeing. Um, what do I see for our research? Entropy management. Management of entropy. Um, we'll have gone through waste heat management. We'll be trying to manage entropy. And I'm sure that we'll be trying to manage 
um, water conflict and um, economics. The conflicts across the globe will be water wars, among other many, many other things. Yeah. The rich, um, there'll be more rich people perhaps. I don't know. Remember that um, we're tanking at the moment. Um, the population dynamics mean that the population curve has to saturate. Therefore, business growth can't just be business growth into the future. It's got to be something else, right? So, um, so what do we do? We, we've got to have global research by then, not just little <coughs> isolated pockets of research. You won't be able to do research unless you're global. It'll be normal. So it's this kind of thing that, that I see. Um, very, very interesting. Now, um, Dom, um, Cyril Ramaphosa actually also mentioned something about um, the funding element that uh, he actually said that uh, uh, during his speech yesterday that he added um, that continued, continuous investment in research and development is critical to South Africa's achievement in the National Development Plan. I mean, now this, this type of funding obviously is um, probably spread across the board. How do you feel is is funding, it, it, how much funding is really necessary in the research space and how much of it is actually given? And, and some of, I, I know that there are many different ideas. Is funding sometimes a, a barrier to, to actually going forward with some of them? Funding's always a barrier to everything. <laughs> CSR in 2085, I'll tell you that procurement will t still take as long. <laughs> um, but but you can do it on your wearable computing clothing, yeah. right? Um, okay, so funding, I think um, research and science will have merged with business. That there won't be the distinction that we persist in making. It won't be the scientists behaving in a certain way and business behaving in a certain way. We won't be here in the scenario where we haven't understood that. Um, so that's how I, I see funding then. Yeah. Fantastic. Hope. And uh, I, I, uh, I guess we are emerging researchers here. We will be merging researchers. Great. All right. Also now, um, just looking back at what uh, some of the, some of the t big talks that were held yesterday, uh, Prof Professor Togozani Majosi, who is the CSIR board um, chairperson, he highlighted the key role that CSIR plays in identifying the key um, determinants of poverty, inequality, unemployment, and uh, he, he actually says that uh, we, we should really make sure that our research is also based on alleviating some of these problems as well. As a researcher, now I'm, I'm going to try and maybe pose this to, to both sides of the season. <laughs> so, as, as, as an emerging researcher, <laughs> no. um, so as an emerging researcher, um, is, um, is something like um, the, your responsibility uh, to, to alleviate poverty and, and, and to help in education, is that something that you, you see very seriously uh, as something that you need to be doing? Or, or are you just concerned about your job at the moment? This is, of course, directed um, to Nike. Yeah, I mean, those are big issues. And <laughs> of course, we have to, um, you know, uh, fully appreciate them and, and, and take them into account when we, when we design our work. Um, I think uh, we can talk about the CSR mandate um, <laughs> and... and uh, uh, the CSR mandate. <laughs> um, ultimately, um, we have to do work that's sustainable as well, and we, we try to work with uh, other stakeholders that also um, are passionate about uh, alleviating poverty. So some work, of course, I mean, this is, this is just a general statement. Uh, some work will, will address those issues, and, and some will be more driven towards uh, generating income. I think it has to be sustainable if we want to have an impact over a long period of time. Yeah. Great. Super fantastic. <laughs> so now, um, just almost, almost in closing, just before we go over to, to the question section, uh, still talking uh, really um, the bigger picture in terms of, in, in terms of um, the crisis that is around right now uh, in the unemployment section. We know that um, South Africa has got one of the highest unemployment um, figures in the in the world uh, there's about 25 percent I think is the unemployment figure right now and about 50 percent of that is young people so 
where, where do you feel like, where, where's the problem? Let's, let's now try to maybe um, narrow it down to science and technology, right? Where, where is the problem? Is it at the universities? Is it at post-university level? Or is it something even before that time? Yes, please. Do you mind if I jump in on this one jump before in. you've decided? Yes. Um, this is the top problem. Poverty, unemployment, and um, uh, inequity. Yeah. Um, these are the top problems of physics right now. Okay? We are not going to have any part of the square kilometer array. We won't be among the Nobel laureates unless we solve education, which is under those. The physics community is at present united on this. The departments, the, the teachers, interestingly, um, even the education and science faculties, which is the most difficult of the whole lot, right? It's got to be the education. So looking back from 2085, I won't be around, but the, you, it, there's a high likelihood that people in this room will live to 100. So um, you, you could be there. Um, <laughs> no, I, I looked at the population pyramids, right? Um, looking back, I think, I think a, a, a critical factor in the survival of the CSR as part of South Africa was the set of education riots, which would have been in the 2020s, um, 2030s, but actually they happened near um, the end of the, the second decade, in a couple of years from 2015. It was the education riots where people clicked that yeah. that's the key mm. and got on with it. About 15 years after the education riots, government departments started to talk to one another and solve the problem. Drops the mic. <laughs> <laughs> now, still, still carrying on with, with this education crisis, when, when we look at uh, some of the things that have happened um, just in, in the recent years, um, government found out that, well, we, our ratio of engineers and scientists versus population is way below par when compared to the, the other countries, even the, the developing countries as well. So what they then did is they gave billions to universities to make more buildings. I mean, the University of Pretoria has the Engineering, engineering 3 building and the mining um, study labs there, more computers, which meant more people coming to varsity and hopefully more graduates also exiting varsity as well. Now, if this is all fair and good, but now we, we had a CSIR and we've had a SOSL and we've had an ESCOM and these have existed for a number of years, but the, the, um, the growth in terms of you know, more business opportunities or maybe more posts being available within these companies um, can also just grow to a certain extent. It can't go, grow grass, drastically, as drastic as a, uh, a new building gets, gets, gets erected at, the, at a university and 500 more people come in. So now what, what has been happening is you have more people graduating and then they, they come out and they're looking for jobs and then there's no jobs for them. What is the answer? Is the answer um, more companies like another CSIR in 70 years from now? Is the answer, um, let me not even give you options. Let me hear from you. What is the answer? Okay. Uh, well, I'm glad the air conditioning came on. <laughs> but, uh, is, okay, the fundamental problem for me is that uh, put in new buildings, get it computers, it's not the answer. Uh, if you look at SK, just to build an Eagle's example, uh, when I was at university, it's the same with PBMR, there were a whole lot of bursaries and scholarships and here. The problem is when the students graduated, there's nothing for them to do. There's no intellectual people who are capable of teaching them. They cannot apply their skills to the actual thing with SKA. So we can have the infrastructure, we have the money. We don't have the people or the skills right now necessary. And this is the same story that I heard five, six years ago. We develop it now, but you look at now and the skills are not there. If the projects keep getting canned or getting pushed, uh, the people who are coming out as engineers or scientists are going to look for other avenues to work in, except in, instead of science and engineering. If you look at the financial sectors, probably anywhere science and engineers are going, except for feeding big into these big SKA projects that we're looking at. So uh, I think priority should be in intellectual capability human capital where you can actually bring back researchers who have gone abroad, overseas. We had a wealth of uh, knowledge, we still do. We just need people who are willing to pass the baton on and uh, 
get a society that's yeah, willing to learn with each other instead of trying to outcompete and outgrow each other. Now I I have a question right here. Is there a question also Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, there, there's a question at the back. Should we catch <laughs> Wait, we will just uh, transfer the mic, right? <laughs> you almost transferred me to Oh goodness. <laughs> That's because it's the talking stick. <laughs> Oh, um, hello? Okay. Yeah. Oh, I actually wanted to probably agree a lot with Nicolin's, Nicolin's last uh, point about, e even within the CSR, I think uh, there's still a lack of how do you build the next generation of researchers and not just saying I want to outcompete whoever's coming behind me. Uh, and to do that, it means you have to be very cooperative. But unfortunately, with most corporate structure, even at CSR, I think it builds on looking for superstars, and that's not the good way to actually build the future of this. And the, the way is to build cooperative and teams, and getting also, if you get students, if you get VEC students, you get interns, you get positive students, you have to develop them and put in the hours to do that. It should not be an afterthought. And if you do that, they're gonna increase their creativity, and I would actually like that when we get these students, they should just be poached. That's my perfect situation, because we've trained them that good, like that good. <laughs> okay. Anyone wants to add to that? I had a question. A question, yes. Um, it's a question for each one of the panel members. I'd like to know personally and honestly, what do you think will be the legacy that you leave at the CSR in the next... When you leave. 70 years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's the mic right here. We can try to use this one. Hey, no one wants to take it. Okay, right. <laughs> we'll start. Hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully my legacy would be, uh, I mean, coming from a previously disadvantaged background, I went on to the international scale and competed, and I hope it just showed other researchers that regardless of where you, where you come from, whatever you do, I mean, I didn't study at all until I got to a trick. I realized my name is going to go in the paper. And the only other time my name will go in the paper when I die. So I make sure I took more than a few lines. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's it, it just to, I mean, for me, my legacy is to show people that you can achieve uh, things. I mean, I'm relevant in the science field to show in the science field that you can achieve something. You can compete on the global scale. Just don't think, oh, my researcher in my office, maybe just in my department if I get recognition. No, compete, compete for a very high scale. And if you don't, you fall a little bit short. If you go international, you'll still be on a continental or national scale. So aim high. Okay. Oh, okay. What do I leave behind? <laughs> um, hopefully, um, at least I can inspire a few of my colleagues. Um, tr hopefully, my passion for my work uh, is infectious. Um, technically, I'm not sure yet what, what, what I'll leave behind. Hopefully, I can contribute as much as possible and, and leave actual technical advances behind as well. But, uh, yeah. and, and, and hopefully, uh, more cooperation between, between our, our, our colleagues. Yeah. Time. <laughs> <laughs> I do have time. <laughs> what makes you think you're getting rid of me? <laughs> that I would leave a legacy. <laughs> so, I was going to get all serious and say the aerodynamics of accelerating flight. But I actually think the joy of working together, um, dare I say the pub lunch, the fact that you can talk to each other, um, the fact that it, the silos actually get broken down from the foundations, that's us. I had, I had the same same thought. I wanted to start with something very technical. Uh, these are all the technical innovations that we want to leave, and this is what we want to achieve in the energy space. But actually, there's more to that. That's uh, energy is just the one vehicle that I'm personally driving forward. But uh, try to do that by means of um, a certain value set, and that's that's something that I hope I will, I will leave when. I leave the CSR, however, that will be in, in 70 years. It will probably solve itself the problem, right? <laughs> um, no, but I mean, the, that value set to me is uh, collaboration as well. It's also transparency. I don't, I don't believe in, in um, uh, sitting on information, on data, on whatever it is that 
and 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 keep that in a secretive manner for the uh, for uh, for competitive reasons. Um, uh, I think I think we have a lot of room to grow. So in a in a space where you have a lot of room to grow, meaning there are so many things that need to be done by so many people, you don't really have to compete with each other. You can by working together and being open, being transparent, you can achieve just more as a collective, and that also helps the individual to achieve more. Um, and I think that that kind of uh, a mindset is what I what I would like to to leave behind. And then in um, I don't know 10, 20 years that we have an energy research uh, area that is um, that is globally <coughs> renowned and recognized, and that and that also by the same spirit, transparency and collaboration also works on the global space. So that uh, I'm a firm believer that especially science is a global village. More, it's, it's, science is probably always a bit more on the forefront than society because um, it, it was always the case that on, in, in the science base you started collaborating across the globe much earlier than, than the borders came, came down between countries. And, um, and I think we, I mean that's, that will be the same in the, in the future as well. So we, that we, we have a global, um, a, a global interaction between uh, energy researchers. Great stuff. Any more questions? I got a question right there at the back, or is that you scratching your head? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, there's a question right here in front. Uh, sorry, I had a comment, and uh, it goes back to the previous yes. theme around unemployment and bringing down borders between the public and private sector. Um, and I just wanted to encourage all of our young researchers to think about entrepreneurship. And I mean, the CSR is very much in support of our own researchers becoming entrepreneurs or getting involved in starting up new companies. And for me, the future you know, that I see in the CSR is people being able to dabble a bit in the lab, go to their company for a few hours, um, because really small business creation and development is the future for uh, sorry for unemployment reduction, growing the economy in the country, and I think some of those opportunities do exist within the CSR for people to start thinking more entrepreneurially. What kind of commercial impact can your research have? So please come and talk to us at the Licensing and Ventures Office if you want to explore this further. Wow, fantastic! Maybe maybe someone might. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's give her a round. <laughs> I got another question right here at the front. I'd like to stretch the distinguished panel's minds a little bit, hopefully. Um, so 70 years ago, the world still thought of the first world, the second world, and the third world around, around the world wars. I'd like to just ask the panel, 70 years from now, um, what would your, if you had to extend your imagination, what would society look like? Would we still have countries? Uh, would the whole world be more open? Would we be more closed? Let's start maybe. Um, well, m maybe... Um, uh, that's, uh, let me let me also relate back to the to the transformation question earlier because I can't really answer that the transformation question because we only came to the country three and a half years ago. I can confirm that we see changes literally every year, so that's a very good sign. But I can tell you a small story out of my own personal history that is actually related to your question and that just shows how quickly things can change. So when when I was born uh, in the 70s, um, Germany was still divided. And it was completely unthinkable that this will ever change, ever, during the lifetime of the people who were, uh, were alive. Definitely not when I was, uh, uh, definitely nobody thought that it would happen when I was of the age of 14. So now you know when I was born, right? So, <laughs> um, so that's, uh, that, that, that speaks to the, to, the, to, the, to the border thing. Then also very, very personally, when, when I grew up, I grew up in a very small village in, uh, in the middle of, of Germany, very conservative, very... Um, uh, uh, not very open-mindedness. I don't know what the opposite of that is, but uh, um, and 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 back then, at the time, um, it was uh, believe it or not. But uh, well, you will probably believe it because here in South Africa, it was impossible to get married when you were black and white. Um, well, in that village, it was not legally impossible, but it was socially unacceptable for a Protestant to marry a Catholic. Yeah. Now, just a few. Just a few decades later, now today here I sit in South Africa, um, Germany is reunited, I'm married to a wonderful lady and she happens to be black and Catholic and I'm Protestant. <laughs> so it's... <laughs> He's done it all. I think, <laughs> yes, yes I, I, think, I think things, uh, th things that we take for granted can change much quicker 
than, than we anticipate. And 70 years is such a long time. I mean, 70 years ago, the Europeans were, were, uh, were, um, were killing each other to, by the millions. Um, and now there are no borders in Europe anymore. And I really hope that the current crisis in Europe with the migration doesn't lead to an old mindset again where you pull up the borders again. Because uh, I'm a firm believer in 70 years from now, we will have economic equalness across the globe, which means you can tear down the borders, it doesn't matter anymore. And people just move wherever they want to live because they like the weather and not because they think the economic conditions are so much better here or there. So that's uh, my, my vision for 70 years. And uh, looking at, at what we've achieved in the last 70 years, I don't think it's unlikely that this will happen. Well, for stuff. I think there will still be poverty. I think that being a South African um, and being part of the CSR in particular places an obligation on scientists to do something about poverty, unemployment and inequality. And uh, there are various ways of doing something about it. Working directly with communities is an obvious way. However, working with global competitiveness with that in mind is another way. And it meets aspirations of young South Africans who don't want to have to leave. This is where the diseases of Africa must be researched, in Africa, not in Finland or the USA or somewhere like that. Um, I do think there'll still be conflict. I think defense will have changed. So there will be more asymmetrical warfare. Um, those who don't have technological advancement are willing to put their lives on the line and have a lot of collateral damage. Um, so I do think there will be conflict, but I think alliances are on the rise and they will regroup, reform um, as time goes on. I think that strategy will have become agile in terms of um, international strategy. I can't make any predictions about politics whatsoever. <laughs> Well, my imagination tells me that um, we'd probably have a global cu currency, no borders, uh, but also microchips embedded in each of us. <laughs> We're probably already being monitored by satellites, so... <laughs> but on a serious note, I hope we uh, better deal with issues such as global warming and uh, the amount of arable land. I'm the last person standing between everyone and lunch. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll keep it short. My hope is that the, the sense of community uh, is instilled in people again, where we look at each other as a human race, uh, not as competitors. Uh, I see Africa with the natural resources and the renaissance in, in science and technology and the sense of, of ownership coming about and being, being a leader. Uh, Hopefully, uh, we don't just have Mars bars and we're actually living on Mars. Uh, but uh, I, I see the, the global, it, it'll have to change. I mean, population dynamics will be a global, global community. Uh, hopefully, we, the frontier of space gets conquered. I hope to see that in the next 30 years. Hopefully, I'll be around. And uh, I think things will, will change. You'll see people, as again, live in different areas, but with virtual presence devices, from science, things like quantum computing, quantum technology, uh, I can just now imagine what I want for lunch and it's going to appear here. <laughs> so, uh, nice. yeah, with, with quantum teleportation, uh, quantum entanglement. <laughs> so from a science point of view, I think science will take that. It will take away the cost of economy. People, the whole point of all the divisions is you want rich and poor. People who have more want more. So hopefully through science, that all will change. Super fantastic. Well, I mean, we have heard already, I think, in the, in the morning's discussion that um, Pretoria, or the city of Tswane, is actually the innovation hub of the country. About 42% of the knowledge and some of the fantastic innovations actually come from here. And uh, you might also be able to debate that in these four walls right here, as some of that knowledge and this means that these emerging researchers right now will be the people that are actually shaping the next 70 years. It, it starts now and it's going to start with you as well. So I hope you, you've taken from this and also taken a sense of responsibility for the, the, the problems we're currently facing and maybe even problems that we will face, that you are the solution and some of the ideas that you might come up with right now 
though sometimes seeming a little stupid, but I mean all good ideas have to sometimes seem a little crazy because if it's not crazy, maybe it's not big enough. All right, so uh, this has been absolutely fantastic. Let's just give our panel a round of applause once again. Thank you very much. much weather. I'm sure you guys, you found this very useful, right? Yeah. And I think I don't, I didn't want to respond, but I, I think I'm very forced to respond to the comment that came from the corner there about what we need to do in order to grow the graduates. I think about six or seven years ago, the CSR um, it did a knee-jerk reaction when we realized that our staff is aging and our staff is white and we need to, to build a lot of young researchers. So we went all out just to build capacity with uh, bursary programs, studentship programs. And, and now I think the next phase is to so what? So we've got the numbers, we're building uh, capacity through the bursary program. Now we need to, to look at graduate development programs, we need to toughen up or, or strengthen our professional development programs. So your comment doesn't go unanswered, we're looking into it. But anyway, thank you very much for bearing with us until the end of our session. And thank you very much to all panelists. Um, it was short notice, but you, you managed to come through. And um, I think we will thank you at a later stage with, with small gifts. We didn't get them on time. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're I right think there at the back. <laughs> oh, she said so. OK. No, that was just it's, me I'm, stretching I'm the my eye. <laughs>